everyone. My name is Sharon, and I'm going to moderate today's program to the extent of um, I will be calling on people during the discussion. Um, today, our program will actually be moderated by Tony Ryan, um, it, and um, he will be actually introducing the speakers. So let me just introduce us the Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. Um, we've, we've existed for more than 10 years and many of our programs are on YouTube and all of them are now, as of, as of a few years ago, all of them are. So um, you can recommend the recording to someone who isn't here. Um, we are an independent group associated with the Marxist Library in Oakland, the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. And we do not represent any particular political organization. We have, we, many of us are parts of, part of all kinds of organizations, but we all are united in, rec in recognizing the importance of the, of the ideas of Karl Marx. And especially the idea that he expressed when he said, Philosophers have, um, have explained the world, but the point is to change it. Uh, later on, we, uh, we will be asking you for contributions because we, we do have expenses. We are, in, of course, during the pandemic on Zoom, but we have every intention to go back to the library in person. However, we're also making plans to continue the Zoom for all of our friends uh, from around this continent and around the world. And it's one of the side effects, one of the few good side effects of the pandemic that we've learned how to do this and to include many more people in our forum. So um, we have today, um, a, a recording from Pablo Menendez, who is um, a Cuban, Amer American Cuban or Cuban American. He's both. And he's uh, sent, he sent us this recording, this message from Cuba, which Alan is about to play. And after that, we hope that Tony's going to be here. And um, if not, we'll We'll, we'll go ahead with our speakers anyway. So go ahead, Alan, thank you. This is Pablo Menendez and this is my letter from Cuba. Many alarmed friends from the United States have reached out in recent weeks asking me to describe what is happening in Cuba. I will attempt to do so, but first a bit about myself. I was born and raised in Oakland, California. My father, Dane, Google her. She was the first U.S. public personality to visit Cuba after the 1959 revolution and the U.S. prohibition on travel to the island. She ended up visiting so often, singing all over the country, that she became a symbol of the friendship between our two countries. I came to Cuba in 1966 to study at the National School of Music, planning to be here for a year. But I liked it so much and felt I was there. ever since for 54 years now. My band is called Pablo Menendez and Mezcla, spelled M-E-Z-C-L-A. You can find us on YouTube. I'm not a journalist, nor an economist, nor a professional analyst. I'm a musician. But I'd like to read you what I've written, summarizing my personal observations. Over the 54 years that I have been living in Havana, I have noticed that every time there is the slightest chance of better relations between the United States and Cuba, the war on Cuba industry steps up its propaganda. In times of crisis, it actually follows the exact same script. But today, they are more powerful than ever. They have huge budgets and new social media tools. The same internet warfare weapons that the whole world saw taking the U.S. to the brink of a civil war by leading Trump's followers to believe that they should take up arms and assault Congress because their leader had been robbed of the elections in the USA. And then you have mainstream U.S. media, 
where you hear next to nothing about the massive protests that have been happening for months in countries all over Latin America and the terrible government repression there. Nor do you hear about the dramatic UN votes against the US blockade of Cuba or the statements by heads of state from all over the world in solidarity with Cuba. Yet now, with the recent intensification of the 62-year-old pressure cooker strategy against Cuba, every negative media report is magnified to incredible levels of absurdity. But yes, everything is more difficult. Electricity problems, water problems, problems with food distribution, possibly worse than we have ever seen it. When practically everything is scarce, finding ways to distribute it justly and fighting hoarders and speculators is a complicated battle, and there is a constant popular debate in search of solutions. So what is my viewpoint? For starters, my wife Barbarita is a Cuban doctor. She goes to work on public transportation every day crosses the city and attends to patients from every walk of Cuban life. We have family all over the country too, so my, you know, my band members are all in different neighborhoods all over Havana. So this gives us a pretty good first-hand information about life in Cuba, and I can speak not from what I see on a little screen, but from first-hand experience. Due to COVID, we have had no live concerts since March 2020 but the Ministry of Culture has guaranteed 100% of our band's salaries, and the same goes for most artists here. We have been learning new virtual ways to work together and have participated in various virtual festivals and concerts. It's been a challenge since we don't really have all the tools necessary for all we would like to do. As the Cuban government quite openly says, due to COVID and the blockade, practically no money is coming into the country. The money from tourism is gone, the money from remittances is gone, the money from professionals working overseas is gone. So the government is having a very hard time providing even the most basic services. Yet they have not raised prices. On the contrary, they finally took the step of unifying the two local currencies so that now the same money used to pay our salary buys everything in the almost empty stores at the same exchange rate. I'm sure this is confusing because all of the news about the dollar stores that are unpopular and have been attacked by vandals during the protests. These looters, by the way, seemed more drawn to taking TVs and appliances than food. I can't tell you much about the dollar stores because I never go to them and I don't even have dollars now. Can't even get in because these stores are monopolized by Cubans with dollars who get online as soon as they open and buy everything possible for resale and speculation. The state correctly estimated that there was a big supply of dollars in the hands of Cubans with family abroad and opened these stores so that those dollars could be reinvested to import food to distribute through the ration book at subsidized prices in Cuban pesos to the general population instead of those dollars being re-exported. The government has been very transparent about their shortcomings and all these urgent problems and we see them working every day to find solutions. When the president actually went in person and talked to the July 11th protesters in San Antonio, he reported later to the nation on TV that he had found three different elements there. Honest citizens voicing their frustrations, others confused or misled, and those he stressed were not to be blamed because they were being virtually bombed by internet media campaigns and a third element of some people with the agenda of inciting violence and provoking incidents to justify a foreign humanitarian, humanitarian intervention, quote unquote, which probably would results, produce results like the 20 year US occupation of Afghanistan or the bombing of Libya. He did not call out troops to repress the demonstrators and there are no missing nor fake trials. The president of Cuba's Supreme Court on television pointed out that the Q new Cuban constitution guarantees the right to peaceful demonstrations and in no way is it illegal to think differently or express one's views. But there was violence and it wasn't spontaneous. And there was apparently a coordinated plan of where and how it would, it would happen. An incredible amount of Facebook, Twitter, etc. Met messages bombarded us for days, dramatically exaggerating the COVID crisis in Matanzas province, calling for a humanitarian intervention or corridor, quote unquote, and then falsely claiming that the various cities had been taken over by the revolt and the government leaders had been arrested or had fled the countries, that the government was repressing and killing what they called the people. <clears throat> 
I have talked to many people who confirm having witnessed acts of violence, rock throwing, looting, Molotov cocktails, worse. But almost everybody who I've spoken to who quote unquote confirms excessive use of force by the police says, I saw it on the videos on the internet. So it seems very strange to me, it seemed very strange to me that in July 11th protests you didn't see the banners common in popular demonstrations in other countries. You know, like, we want food, jobs, peace, free education, free health care, stop repression and police brutality, stop racism. None of that. It was strange to see most demonstrations with a smartphone in their hands filming it. What I'm trying to say is that from childhood in the USA, I was brought up to support popular demonstrations and all my life I have participated in them. So I noticed this stuff. It was all so very unusual and cure and alarming to see hundreds, not ten of thousands as they claimed, chanting Patria y Vida and Abajo la Dictadura, slogans made in the USA. I didn't see any slogans or banners that I felt represented me or my family, neighbors or friends. And I have tried to understand, well, who was it that was demonstrating? So just some ideas. Some of the protesters were people who worked at jobs in the private sectors and small business owners have been hurt by Donald Trump's sanctions and now by COVID and now are facing more extreme difficulties. Illogically, they tend to blame the government here. The same goes for people who didn't work at all but lived on remittances from the U.S. and now don't get any because Trump cut them off. It's amazing to think that it was just five years ago when President Obama visited Cuba and walked around Havana with his wife and kids. He spoke to the nation live on the most popular, on, on TV and appeared on the most popular Cuban TV show. Obama said that a U.S. blockade hadn't worked for almost 60 years and that it was tried, time to try something else. He had the same objectives of regime change but a different strategy. With the opening between our two countries, everything was better for the people of Cuba. The private sector that the U.S. government loves so much was thriving. Everybody was better off in Cuba and the Cuban community abroad, full of hope and plans for the future. But then came Donald Trump, who put all his might into the job of making regime change in the blockade work. He reversed Obama's openings and added sanctions that cut off trade, travel, and remittances. Trump prohibited almost all the flights stopped the family reunification program, made up a hoax to close the U.S. consulate, and it's, so it's impossible to get any type of visa for the USA and Cuba. While the, meanwhile, Cuba provides visas for U.S. citizens to visit Cuba at the airline's check-in counter when you get on the plane coming to Cuba. All the things Trump did made life much harder for Cubans, and that has always been the ob object of these sanctions. But it has been especially criminal in these times when the world needs to come together to fight this pandemic. Now, Biden is following the same policy despite his campaign promises. But think about it. If life in Cuba was so much better when Obama removed just some of the 60-year-old sanctions, what would life be like in Cuba with no blockade? Well, who could say? The U.S. has never removed its sanctions, despite the demands of all of the world's nations who have voted in the General Assembly, the world getting together in the U.N. and voting against the U.S. policy for 29 years in a row. The last time it was 184 countries against two, the United States and Israel. Yes, things are tight in Cuba. COVID is hitting us hard, especially now with the Delta variant. Yet, if you compare our COVID numbers with practically any other country, including the United States, the government is taking very good care of us and the death rate is very low. I had COVID and was in a regular Q and isolation center, so I can tell you firsthand that with very few resources, the health workers do everything they can to take care of us. The government is trying very hard to vaccinate all 11 million Cuba, Cubans with vaccines developed right here in Cuba. Things have been very calm nationwide here since July 13th, but the internet has continued to bomb us and the world with messages of hate and threats. Fake photos, edited videos, talk of dictatorship, regime change, foreign intervention, military options. Local media here, on the other hand, is full of messages about love, about doctors, not bombs, about solidarity, about positive social change, and the history of the revolution. 
While one side demands changing the old slogan of patria o muerte to patria y vida, our president changed his slogan to ponle el corazón a Cuba. There has been no name calling of you or use of terms like gusano. Another thing, you know there really is a prison in Cuba where people are held for years with no, tar no charges and tortured. It is in Guantanamo, run by the U.S. government and paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Biden's pronouncements on Cuba have been totally in line with the domestic war on Cuba industry. The embargo that Biden is enforcing, what we here in Cuba and the rest of the world calls a blockade, is a cruel policy designed to make our lives miserable. The U.S. government is like a cop with his knee on our throat. We can't breathe. Sure, there's a lot to criticize about Cuba. It is not perfect and no one says it is, not even the Cuban government. But those who criticize Cuba right now remind me of the people who talked about George Floyd's supposed character flaws to try to justify a policeman slowly killing him while other officers stood by and watched with guns drawn. A blockade is an act of war. The world calls it genocide. So is it time now to analyze Cuba's problems versus virtues, to stand by with your hands folded and watch, or to actually do something to get the boot off the neck of us Cuban people. Many people in the world are organizing solidarity, sending food and much needed medicine and medical supplies. And I would ask you today, where do you stand? Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. How moving. Thank you for playing that. And we need to send our thanks back to Pablo for that great introduction. So um, is Tony Ryan here? Hi, this is Bill Martinez. I you know, called and left a message with Tony. I also spoke with Gloria during this Pablo's presentation. She said she's blocked. No, I'm, no, she's okay now. Oh, she, oh, there she is. Okay, okay, Gloria, good. So apparently Tony is having trouble getting on. Oh. Shoot. And we don't have Tony, but we do have Gloria and Cheryl. Oh, good. So um, I will, um, Gloria, Gloria, I think um, if you could unmute and then, and just, uh, be the host in Tony's absence, that would be the best solution, I think, to this. Okay, well, uh, I spoke to Tony last night and this morning where he said they would show Pablo's message, which is really great. And then I would speak and then Cheryl would speak. Okay. <laughs> so, be, okay. Um, so I'd like to begin, I think there'll be a lot of discussion generated by this, but I would like to say a few things. Um, my name is Gloria Lariva. I live in the Bay Area, San Francisco. I've been a longtime supporter of Cuba's revolution, as I imagine everybody on this call or, uh, is. And I was in Cuba in late May and early June for two weeks. I was able to meet with and interview a lot of people, and I'm just producing those videos now. And I saw at that time, every morning when you would wake up, Dr. Duran, the one who reports on the COVID cases and the situation in, on television, you would hear him announce that every day about a thousand cases of positive, new positive cases were, were rising. It was a thousand, eleven hundred, and that was very worrisome to people. Then when I came home, three weeks later, the numbers grew to 3,000. 3,500. And then in early July, it was a shocking 6,500. Now in the last days, it's been in the 8,000s, even as high as 9,700 9, cases a day. And right after the July um, disturbances, which was a Sunday, on Monday the next day, the president had a four and a half hour meeting with the public and all the ministers with scientists and doctors in order to address what was taking place, what were the difficulties they were facing and in a message of unity and the need to struggle together. And one big issue at that time was that the Antonio Guiteras electrical 
generating plant was down. They've had a great deal of difficulty with most of the generators in the country <clears throat> because of an inability to maintain the plants due to the blockade, due to the lack of parts and the fuel that has been cut off deliberately by the US, the shipments from Venezuela to Cuba, which began in 2019. And so all these factors led to that Antonio Guitera's main generating plant shutting down. And the head of the Ministry of Energy and Mines said, we're working day and night, 24 hours a day to get it put up. Well, the next day it came up, but they also explained because of the COVID crisis, and remember, that was um, about 6,000 cases, new cases a day, that much of the generation of electricity was going to the centers, the hospitals, to where the thousands of people are being isolated, taken care of in the very stages of, of illness. And that that is why they had to have staged blackouts. And since that time, it's even gotten more difficult that several plants have been down at different times. We have to understand that one of the key elements in the US communications aggression, because it's not only the blockade, but it's also transmitting lies through the US and other Western media to create this message and narrative to the people of the US and the world that Cuba is a failed state that it's incapable because of socialism or other reasons, that, um, that the blockade is not the issue. And you'll find some of these opposition elements saying, it's not the blockade. Sometimes you'll even hear people in Cuba uh, telling you in, in the streets, it's, that's just an excuse. But in fact, it is the blockade. It's the overwhelming, in fact, the principal, and I would say the only cause of this crisis because without the blockade, Cuba could resolve other issues and other problems, economic problems. But anyway, I think that's one of our challenges for the progressive movement is to reveal exactly what the blockade does, which is the US government, which is our government and our tax dollars. The blockade was not only one signed on February 3rd, 1962 by Kennedy, but also the Torricelli law of 1992 November, signed by George Bush Sr., which um, blocked ships from coming both to a U.S. harbor and to a Cuban harbor without the risk of being confiscated by the U.S. for six months, really cutting off Cuba's ability to trade with alternate sources. Or the Helms-Burton Law, signed by Clinton in 1996, which the Title III, which was the most serious element of the Helms-Burton Law, um, was suspended for years by the presidents until Trump lifted that Title III and ensued several thousand lawsuits against corporations that invest in Cuban property that used to be owned by the United States or owned by Cubans who then became U.S. citizens after the revolution. So the blockade is the critical issue that we need to fight. And I think we need to understand what US media is doing. Now, the, there is a very important article and I know I talked to Tony because he was the host in putting these articles and information on the chat, but it's an article published in the People's Tribune of Canada. I think it's the Communist Party of Canada in which a woman named Catherine Guerrera she, uh, and if somebody wants to post it, because I don't think I have the ability to do so, so you can look at cuba-venezuela.org. That's the organization that I head up. It's cuba-venezuela.org. And there's an article two or three down that says what really happened on July 11th. And Catherine Guerrera relates that the timing of this was because of the huge increase that I mentioned in late June, largely because of Father's Day, people began to visit their families, they're tired, just like here in the US. And because it's a plan of US color revolution that has been in place for many years, the US 
taking advantage of the 243 measures of Trump, decided this is the moment. The cases are serious. Uh, it's exploding in Cuba. The direction of all medicine toward the COVID patients, the lack of medicine in pharmacies, the shortages of food, now is the time. And on June 23rd, the very day that the United Nations General Assembly was voting after many great speeches by different countries saying Cuba is heroic in its medical efforts and solidarity with the world, that on that day, 184 countries voted to tell the US to lift the blockade as they call it embargo only US and Israel voted against Cuba. But on that day, um, President Bruno Rodriguez spoke and he warned that there was, that their data was showing an uptick, a major increase in social media directed against Cuba. And they felt there was something happening. But he also said that it was evident, um, this communications operation that was underway and then, of course, in the following days, began to appear thousands of, of accounts, false tweet accounts. And then on the day before the July 11 protests, a million and a half tweets were generated. That wasn't by super busy activists online. That was by a high-tech US operation, a CIA-funded operation that only could happen by the United States. And the slogans of SOS Cuba, SOS Matanzas, why hashtag SOS Matanzas was because that's where half of the cases were at that moment in the country. And how would Cubans have thought of that except because they were told to. So another element of the Biden aggression now, because Biden not only has embraced the 243 measures signed by, by Trump, but also has in the last four weeks, it was usually on the last Friday, but he jumped it up by a day this last Thursday when Blinken announced new sanctions. The sanctions have been directed toward Biden saying, we're going to bring in internet, independent internet to overcome any possibility of Cuba blocking the internet. Because as you know, for a couple of days, the internet was blocked in order to stop this operation from Miami and the CIA telling people rise up or giving them other instructions or giving false news on that day. <clears throat> and so Biden, his first sanctions was we're gonna increase or we're gonna bring in independent internet. That's much like what they did in 1985 with Radio Marti and 1990 with TV Marti, a total violation of the international uh, communications laws that no country is allowed to invade another country's telecommunications. Um, and that's what the US is threatening to do. But Friday, I mean, last Thursday, Biden announced new measures, actually Blinken did, in which they said they were applying measures against the head of the prison system and the head of the National Revolutionary Police. Why? They want to use these measures to try to create the narrative that there's this great repression taking place of arrests, of disappeared people, of hundreds of people that they don't know what's happened to them, um, and of people being repressed in prison. This is really astonishing from the country that has the highest number in absolute and relative numbers in the world, the United States, of prisoners, of torture cells that we know of here, or of a thousand police, mainly black and Latino youth who are murdered every year by the US with impunity. And so one of these fake videos that took place on that day was one that maybe you saw, but it was one played over and over. It was transmitted by Miami Herald, by a lot of other international media. And it was one of, you know, this shaky kind of media, supposedly a police busting down someone's door in the neighborhood and a woman screaming that she has children in her house, screaming, screaming, and then supposed gunfire, boom, boom, boom. And she says, my husband's killed. Why did you do this? Blood on the floor. Well, it was a complete fake, complete fake. And if you read that article by Catherine Guerrera from the People's Tribune of Canada, she was there. She has family in Cuba and she happened to be in Cardenas where that supposedly took place. And she says, 
everybody knows that woman and who she is. So this follows US CIA other operations that have taken place in other countries. As I said, the color revolution, the putsch style operations that together with the massive media blitz, fall, false news uh, inside the targeted country to create more chaos. And then certain individuals appear to ask for US military intervention. That's what happened in Cuba. I was asked to also say something about the San Isidro movement. You've probably seen that. They're a group that has gotten a lot of play in the US in the last few months. San Isidro is a small part of a neighborhood in central Havana. Central Havana is a neighbor, is a large area of Havana that is between old Havana, you know, buildings of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and the central Havana is um, one from the 1800s, early 1900s, that if you walk through there, it's pretty shocking because the buildings are very worn down. Many buildings have collapsed due to lack of materials or the inability to rebuild them. Cuba not only has the blockade and other issues and challenges economically, but they have hurricanes. They've had major hurricanes since 2008 where hundreds of thousands literally of homes have been destroyed and they have to put their resources to rebuild those. But anyway, <clears throat> the U.S. has focused on this San Isidro movement, a creation of the U.S. AID, the National Endowment for Democracy. And it's using culture, trying to attract Cuban youth and create this message to youth around the world that the youth of Cuba are rising up and rejecting the revolution. The leader of it is a young man named Yotuel. He's a rapper. And using this culture, heavily promoted at first with music, hit messages, and later mobilizing an act of opposition. Since July 11, Yotuel has revealed himself fully to demand US intervention, military intervention, for a tightening of the blockade. And when Biden announced one of his sanctions a few weeks ago at the White House, with other right-wing Cuban figures was Yotuel. He had first gone to the European Parliament and begged for European intervention and for a tightening of the blockade. Then he was at the White House, standing side by side with his V, side by side with Roberto Menendez. Roberto Menendez, who is this right-wing Democrat has been advocating and pushing for legislation against Cuba for years. So this is Yotuel, who's openly now calling for US intervention. Um, another element of this hybrid war against Cuba is creating a pressure cooker situation. I was trying to hear, thanks to Bill's phone, um, Pablo's speech. I didn't hear all of it, but I think he was talking about the visas that are not being allowed, the entry visas for Cubans to the United States. There was that immigration crisis that happened in 1994, set up by the US again during a special period when it was a very hard time for Cuba, extremely difficult hard time. And people wanted to leave the island. But as a result of that crisis, where the US actually imprisoned 35,000 Cubans who had left Cuba on Guantanamo base, that prison cre was created before Abu Ghraib. But anyway, um, or and Guantanamo. Anyway, the crisis right now is that the U.S. has virtually stopped any visas being processed at the U.S. Embassy in Havana. And a couple of years ago, the U.S. said to Cubans, you have to go to Costa Rica, to the U.S. Embassy there to file for a visa and expect to stay for weeks or months because it'll take a while. In other words, trying to create another pressure cooker environment like it happened in 1980 or in 1994. And again, referring to the foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez at the UN speech that he gave before the UN vote on the blockade, June 23rd, he said, there are a few are raving about causing an in irregular and uncontrolled migratory flow between the US and Cuba. This is a dangerous gamble about which we have alerted the US government, which has a legal and moral obligation to honor immigration agreements, which both countries signed, particularly in the area of visas. 
it is a sensitive issue that costs lives. And we have warned yesterday, and I reiterate now, our warning to the United States government. Um, and another element is demonizing and the attack in the international missions of Cuban doctors working abroad. Pablo Menendez did refer to this where he talked about that income of hundreds of millions of dollars being cut off from Cuba by first Bolsonaro in November 2018, Trump too, following the dictates of the US and expelling 10,000 Cuban doctors, leaving millions of poor Cubans, with, I mean, Brazilians without health care. And Cuba, as a result, lost hundreds of millions of dollars in income. So this, sisters and brothers, it was what Cuba is facing. And again, the numbers are growing in Cuba despite this heroic effort of five vaccines. Cuba is not a failed state. It is a country, a socialist country, where the resources are marshaled with the absence of profit motive in the healthcare industry and the scientists in biotechnology because they knew that they could not rely on US dominated pharmaceutical industry for vaccines, they created their own, like they create their other vaccines, the lung cancer vaccine, a, a, a certain marvel. So those five vaccines are being used, three in particular, but it's still difficult, the resources and the lack of syringes. So this great effort that I'm sure Cheryl will talk about, I'll leave that for her, about the syringes campaign. And, um, and the need for solidarity is, is really, really great. Just like the 1990s in the special period when the caravans going to Cuba by Pastors for Peace, IFCO Pastors for Peace, and many of us were on those first caravans, or countries around the world sending buses, food, medicine. This is a time for solidarity. We can't let the US continue with this war without us fighting it as well. And I think that Cuba has also shown by its revolutionary leadership, by the mass organizations, by the Communist Party of Cuba, that the organizations that have helped revolution survive, they're all engaged now in going to the communities that are the most difficult economically, going including to the neighborhoods that have been created um, over the years since the special period of people who've moved from other provinces, to move from one province to another, in order to maintain you know, stability in the infrastructure and resources of the country, people have to apply for permission to move to another province to make sure you have a job, you have housing. But a lot of people have moved into Havana. And so a lot of people who were complaining and protesting didn't have ration food because their food from their book that they get the ration food comes from their province that they don't live in anymore. So right away, the government has been providing, um, I think through new ration cards, but certainly they're providing food now, ration food at an extremely low cost to those people who are living now in Havana and other areas. The youth are mobilized now to go address issues, to go poll people like they have done in the past. The mass organizations working together and the committees in defense of the revolution are reactivated again because after years of stability, people didn't feel like they had to do the nightly guard duty in their, in their neighborhoods to prevent you know, crime or terrorism like what happened in the early years of the revolution. But in recent months, in particular one day, August 6th, some youth went and broke windows and threw rocks at a polyclinic in a town in the middle of the night. And so in this article in Grandma, the youth have been mobilized in their CDR, the Committee in Defense of the Revolution, to say, now we're doing duty from 8 p.m. to 4 in the morning to watch in the streets to make sure that other crimes are not committed against people so that the police don't have to be doing what the service of the community does. Um, I was reading an article the other day in Granma uh, about the need for more oxygen, you know, the there was a supply of oxygen was very, very low. And so everybody was mobilized from the military to even the diving boats where people use the 
tanks go, to go underground to, to die. They're using all those resources to step up the operation because the main plant producing the oxygen, medicinal oxygen for the people on ventilators was broken down. Again, lack of resources. And so I was reading an article in Granma about connectors, these little 3D printed Y pieces that are being produced now by the Neuroscience Center. They were appealed to make us some of these pieces so that we can double the capacity of a ventilator to treat two people at a time. I spoke with David Paul uh, of the Bay Area from Saving Lives Campaign. I'm going to Cuba with a good amount of resin. We spoke to the Neuroscience Center to bring that material to them so they can keep producing those connectors. But a lot of people are doing so as well. In other words, the need is great. The solidarity is there. Let's keep working, sisters and brothers, to counter the media lies of our own government and to say that what we need in this country is revolution ourselves. We, we're not going to buy this lie that Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua have to be overthrown, that they're failed states because of socialism or moving towards socialism. We know what capitalism has done to the world. We know what our own government has done. And we only have to see the Afghanistan crisis and disaster. It didn't begin 20 years ago. It began in 1978, trying to overthrow the revolution of 78. And I will stop. Thank you. This, oh, this is fantastic. Thank you, Gloria. This is Tony Ryan. and. I've had a couple of problems this morning getting online and I'm online now. Um, but I also, uh, there was internet, some kind of weird internet thing, but also, um, and this is very sad news, but apparently um, our friend and comrade Jack Hirschman died in his sleep last night. And um, so I don't know anything more than that, but um, he recently was in Cuba himself and he's one who's very involved with the poetry movement in the United States and internationally and a Bay Area figure and a friend of Cuba. And I just wanted to let people know that. So excuse for the technical problems and the sad news, but thank you, Gloria, very much. And I'm sorry I missed um, Pablo's um, presentation. Um, and now we're gonna go to, to Cheryl Labash and I'll- Tony. Thank you. Hello? Hello? We hear you, Tony. We heard okay. you. Uh, Cheryl, Hi, you're Bill. unmuted. Okay. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Gloria and and also Pablo Menendez for explaining the facts of what's happening. Uh, what Tony has asked me to talk about is more the, uh, the solidarity movement uh, and what has been and can be done. Uh, this is the 30th anniversary of the National Network on Cuba, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, 30 years ago, the Soviet Union had been defeated. Cuba's major Eastern Europe trading partners disappeared. Together with the quick and deep economic crisis that Gloria referred to, the threat of the US invasion was real. We are grappling today with a similar situation, but in a very different world. The NNOC was formed so our movement could focus on the points uniting us and leave the not inconsequential rest to work out on another day so we could fortify the Cuban solidarity movement. And like Gloria said, what, what came out at that time were groundbreaking confrontations of the, the, of the blockade showing the solidarity here in this country. There are basically 52 member organizations in the NNOC, small, large, local, and national, with a range of interests and political views, but who agree with 
defending self-determination and sovereignty for Cuba. Lately, the organizations that are coming in also focus on Venezuela. Solidarity with the Cuban people's struggle for independence from colonialism and later imperialism did not begin in 1991 when the NNOC was formed or even 1959 with the revolution. We only have to point to the Henry Reeve Brigade and Henry Reeve, the Civil War veteran who fought and died in Cuba's war against Spain. The brigade named after him, of course, and many of us I'm sure signed the petitions, uh, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize the, uh, for the International Medical Brigades. Much has changed in these last 30 years. 1991 was the first year a resolution to end the US blockade of Cuba was introduced in the United Nations and in 1992 was voted on the first of the 29 consecutive annual international votes condemning the US unilateral war on Cuba. We went through defending the right of Elian and Juan Miguel to go back uh, to Cuba and live freely in Cuba. We fought for the Cuban Five and were successful in uh, returning all five to their homeland in Cuba. And we witnessed Obama's new but short-lived engagement with Cuba, uh, a strategy that was a double-edged sword. While it was very good for Cuba, it also had a dagger pointed at Venezuela and the rest of Latin America, opening the door to the, the sanction policy that's been tightened against Venezuela. But at the same time, we can't ignore a technological revolution that has transformed our lives. If we were ignoring it creeping up on us, the coronavirus pandemic brought that reality home. Up until February 2020, the movement in solidarity with Cuba worked in their city, doing basically the regular work, educational work, outreach. Uh, NNOC member organizations came together twice a year to share initiatives and ideas. Up until February, 2020, the Venceremos Brigade was following up from its 50th anniversary a uh, tremendous trip to Cuba and working on internal developments. IFCO was working on recruiting for the Elon scholarships and planning delegations in the French shipment caravan. Code Pink was involved throughout Latin America and other countries. The trials of the Venezuelan embassy defenders uh, of which David Paul was one was finally over and they were free to travel again. WOLA and LOG and other organizations did legislative research, routine local work. And since 2016, the NNOC worked city by city, encouraging local resolutions against the blockade and managed to get quite a few. November 2019, many of us were at the Solidarity Conference in Havana. The NNOC was preparing for the next May Day Brigade. We had just printed 20,000 educational and the blockade brochures for local areas to use. Generally speaking, it's my observation that there was not much cross-pollination between areas unless people were in the same political organization or had friendships or alliances from other involvement. There was some sharing of speakers or film showings, you know, like Maestro, when some of the, the um, women who participated came. There were uh, events in, in many cities, particularly on the East Coast. Um, but there wasn't any national function. There was, though, a voluntary group that was working on following up a conference for US-Cuba normalization that was held in New York in 2017. Of course, it was scheduled for March 22nd and 23rd, 2020, and there was not a venue to be found anywhere. So what happened with our work? What happened with the solidarity work? 
some of the panels that were prepared for that conference were shown on Zoom. And people who had discounted digital organizing were actually surprised that it gave us many, many new options of reaching people not only across the country, but around the world. Of course, that's old hat now. And Zoom, Zoom webinars are frequent and very informative and helpful, but it's not like the cutting edge of the Cuba Solidarity Movement anymore. Uh, we were also able to partner with the Canadian Network on Cuba and work transborder in a, in a regular ongoing way. But when the pandemic swept down on our communities, and I, I'm speaking to you from Detroit, and we had firsthand uh, experience with the shock in March, uh, the Black communities, Latinx, Indigenous communities were just devastated. Um, Cuba had plans and ways to fight the pandemic. They didn't have the vaccines that Gloria referred to yet, but they had other medications that could help boost your immune system and, and other health ways of protecting people as much as possible. But here in the United States, because of the blockade, we were denied access to that expertise. As a result of that crisis, the Saving Lives campaign was jointly developed by the Canadian Network on Cuba, the National Network on Cuba, and La Tabla de Concertación y Solidarité Quebec Cuba to aggressively solicit resolutions promoting medical collaboration with Cuba as a way of beating down the door and saying, we need to end the blockade. A medical committee was reached to, was formed to do um, programs, reach out to medical professionals, and has been really tremendously successful in some areas, especially in the Bay Area and also in uh, Minnesota in particular. So that was like the beginning of the Saving Lives campaign. There were more local resolutions uh, achieved since May 5th, 2020, than had been uh, gotten since uh, 2016, when the effort at gathering these local resolutions. There are resolutions from major international unions, like the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, that also donated money for the syringe campaign. The Washington State Labor Council, um, Cleveland, Chicago, the Illinois uh, State Assembly and other state assemblies, uh, really school boards, county commissions have passed resolutions opposing the blockade. This was a tremendous uh, demonstration of the, the breadth of the opposition to US policy that Washington does not represent the will of the people here in the United States. Even during the pandemic, there was an effort to try to make that felt. And you know, one way was through the resolutions and then going back and trying to make those resolutions a reality to see what could be possible in local areas. And there, in, for example, in the Bay Area, there is a collaboration with the National Nurses Union where one of the presidents spoke on one of the webinars very uh, forcefully and, and clearly about uh, Cuba and ending the blockade. These are all things that came together. Uh, and it's important actually to, to look back on them because of what we're facing right now at this moment. Um, in the summer of 2020, there was a new development and that was the Carlos Lazo and his sons and nephews bicycled from Seattle to Washington, DC. That bicycle trip calling for an end to the blockade, calling for bridges of love between the United States and Cuba 
inspired a group of Cuban Americans in Miami to begin doing caravans there as well. Monthly caravans began and they were initiated by Cuban Americans. They appealed to the solidarity movement to join with them. And as a result, every month in many cities across the United States and Canada, and then some months around the world as well, and sometimes even in Cuba, there are caravans, uh, bicycle, car, um, demonstrations on foot, um, rallies, different kinds of expressions on the last Sunday of every month over the past year. Cuba had been really on the, had held back the pandemic uh, and Gloria talked about this. So I'm going to um, like skip over some of it. Uh, really up until they, they reopened, they made it possible for relatives to come for the holidays at the end of 2020. Um, and with the tremendous um, uh, increase in uh, the coronavirus with the Delta variant uh, that spread throughout the country for the first time really, um, Cuba has had to use uh, a lot of resources that are used for generally other things to deal with people who are sick, who are infected. This has created uh, you know, a tremendous strain on the economy. Uh, in addition to all of the other, the blockade of course, and the, the, uh, the fact all of the other things that were mentioned both by Pablo and by Gloria. Um, and at the same time, with this tremendous biotechnology industry that began uh, in the early 1980s at the, in the initiative of Fidel, uh, blossomed into producing these five vaccine candidates. Even though Cuba has had a hard time getting the raw materials to produce the vaccines, um, they are producing them, they are uh, providing them to the, the Cuban people and will provide them around the world as well in solidarity, unlike what we see, the, the hoarding of uh, vaccine that we see in the former, well, the imperialist countries in the United States and Europe. So always the question is what more can we do? And the Canadians who have a little bit of an easier time with the blockade than we do here in the United States, raised money and bought 2 million syringes that were just now delivered in, in Cuba. Um, they asked, could the US do more? Is, this is a much larger country. There's a tremendous solidarity movement. Can we do more? And thanks to Global Health Partners um, that did a lot of research into how this could be done, how it could be carried out, uh, the Syringes for Cuba campaign was formed. It honestly was the most, um, uh, you know, I, I really had never seen so many organizations that had been involved in Cuba come together for one campaign. Uh, it was really tremendous. A lot of people dug deep into their personal uh, finances, people who, who could do that, but organizations, uh, including uh, the People's Forum, uh, Code Pink, um, the Center for Cuban Studies, Medic, uh, the Solidarity uh, uh, bike caravans would collect, make uh, big syringes and uh, do collections on the street. Labor unions contributed. People who had previously taken groups 
uh, especially the uh, building relations with Cuban labor located on the West Coast. They went back to people who had been on their, their labor trips to Cuba and asked them since they you know, hadn't been going to Cuba and maybe they were able to save some money, could they contribute money? And really literally half in just a very short time, more than half a million dollars, half, excuse me, half a billion, uh, $500,000, $500, not half a million, half a million, I was right the first time, $500,000 uh, has been collected and I believe money is still coming in to buy uh, syringes and 6 million syringes, 4 million of which have been delivered to Cuba and are in use, 2 million that are still on the way are um, there to help with the, with the uh, inoculation, the vaccination campaign in Cuba to push back the virus. Um, so we were looking for other things that we could do. Well, we did an all states campaign to show that there was at least one person in every single state in the United States that opposed the blockade. Would they hold up a sign that said, hands off Cuba? And we were able to get that before the uh, June 23rd vote at the United Nations. Then we had Carlos Lasso once again another summer, this past summer, initiating a march on foot from Miami to Havana, to Havana, to Washington. Um, he, six people accompanied him. They walked and met with people all across Florida that has set the basis for having a Florida-wide solidarity movement. And then Atlanta, cities in North Carolina, in Virginia, and on the 25th of July came to Washington, DC. And of course, that was only two weeks after July 11th, when the um, counter-revolutionary uh, impetus by the United States was in full bloom in Washington at that time. But one thing I wanna say is it, in Washington, we were able to gather 400 people who came primarily from the East Coast. From uh, A bus came from Washington, DC. It was the first demonstration about Cuba since the pandemic began. But the strength of it was from across the country, being able to act together as a unit. Cities like Fresno, California, Young people were so excited to do something that on the 24th and the 25th, there were events in Fresno. In Seattle, Los Angeles, Fresno, San Francisco, Albuquerque, in Dallas, in Atlanta, in Milwaukee, in Pittsburgh, there were events. And in many of those cities, they were able to get uh, media coverage too. So we were able to, while we were in Washington, and thanks very much to the Answer Coalition and Code Pink and others who were on the ground in Washington for making that a success and organizing the defense of that rally in the midst of probably more than a thousand very uh, hostile <laughs> uh, Cuban Americans who had been brought to Washington to pressure the Biden administration against Cuba. Um, but we were able to point at the whole country that still the rest of the country does not agree with the Biden administration and the blockade. So these are um, some of the things, one of trying to figure out how to do what, what Gloria laid out, that we have to continue to fight in solidarity, to show our solidarity, to continue raising funds now for other medical supplies 
looking at what Cuba has asked for and needs and raising money for that. And you can still contribute to globalhealthpartners.org uh, slash syringes for Cuba. Uh, I'm sure that the, the webpage will be uh, updated to include the other medical supplies uh, that are needed, but also always in, con in, in contact and consciousness of what Cuba actually needs at the time. Um, so this working together across time zones and across national borders is continuing. And one thing that we can do is also show that, that Cuba has answers to the problems that we have here in the United States. We have seen that they have developed ALBA and CELOC and Petro Caribe to try to find ways of having international trade that's not exploitive. There are facts about Cuba that are not known. For example, that the Cuban people own their own homes. They do not have to worry about being thrown out as people are facing here in the United States um, with the end of the, the uh, moratorium on, on evictions. Um, we've seen their, their Terea Vida uh, of dealing with environment and climate, climate, and uh, of course we all know about the free healthcare and education. So we need to find a way of mobilizing beyond the choir to find ways to amplify our work when we do it. So it's not just us feeling good about what we're doing in our local area. We need to find a way to nurture and expand the collective efforts to maximize our impact politically and with people who are not already engaged. Part of that is developing media con connections and social media. We have friendly commentators, friendly radio programs all across this country, but there is no way yet of linking them together so that the same message can be broadcast. We've seen the tremendous work of um, our friends in, in Chicago, and uh, Bill Martinez is with us today, that did groundbreaking work of, of concerts with Cuban musicians and US musicians uh, a year ago, July 26th, that was also groundbreaking. So that creativity of doing, uh, uh, finding new ways of showing our solidarity, building our movement here inside the United States, and not letting the Biden administration or any of the um, warmongers in the United States that are looking to undo the revolution in Cuba to succeed. Together we can end the blockade of Cuba, let Cuba live, let Cuba breathe, end the blockade. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Cheryl. And and Gloria and Tony, um, we will have a discussion period in just a, just a couple of minutes. But before that, I wanted to call on um, I want to call on Richard Fallenbaum to say just a couple words about money. Richard, yes, thank you. Well, I just want to reiterate the appeal for for support for this. Cuban solidarity, which is obviously uh, um, a pre pre um, the most important thing right now. But um, the um, Institute for the Critical Study of Society, which is the sponsor of this um, event, uh, also needs small amounts of money. So after you've made a contribution to the various organizations that are doing um, solidarity work, um, I want to commend you to uh, make a contribution to our organization. I put it on the, uh, some information on the um, uh, chat. Uh, you might have also seen it on the uh, email. At any rate, some information on how you can contribute and um, please consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. 
So um, I'm going to keep a stack of uh, people who want to speak, and I will um, I will be che I'm checking the participants list. So please put your hand up if you would like to share anything. Um, we get upcoming and, programs also. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Helen. Before we before we have the discussion. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jean Rule to talk about future programs of Sunday morning or Sunday, whatever time it is in your, at your home. Uh, Jean, do you want to say a few words about that? Uh, yes, thank you. And let me just um, uh, get that up here. But uh, yeah, it, we, we, we meet on Sunday morning in Oakland, the center of our universe. So. Uh, Hope, hopefully, but we, I know people are, have different time zones around the world and we're mindful of that. But um, every Sunday morning we do meet and uh, we organize this. And, and, and thank you so much for the program today. It's a reminder that put, even the little bit we do here is very important and we're very happy we can get these voices out. Next work we're going to, week, we're going to continue with a program is the U.S. global empire actually in decline? And I'm sure we all have opinions on this. We'll have a chance to discuss this with uh, two very uh, knowledgeable people, Stansfield Smith, uh, who's spoken at the library before, and I, many of you know him, um, and also Roger Harris, who is uh, with the Task Force of Americas, as well as the, uh, the ICSS here. So that's coming up next week. And we have more programs coming up and uh, um, uh, you can sign up to our uh, email list and receive regular re reminders by going to icssmarks.org and filling out the rel relevant material. And back to you, Sharon. Thank you. Um, so I have three people right now on the stack, Raj, Trayon, and Mary. And I'm going to be keeping track of the stack. The, the co-hosts can't raise their hand. So if you want, if any of the co-hosts want to speak, you should send me, uh, message me in the chat. I also have Walter. So go ahead, Raj. Thank you for, uh, to all our speakers. Um, I learned a lot uh, more than I learned otherwise. Uh, so uh, my uh, first comment is that Cuba is the greatest socialist country in the world. We, it needs our solidarity and support. Uh, so I'm fully for that. My, but my question is this, uh, the peoples of the world will respond, are responding. What about the governments? Uh, used to be uh, India too under uh, previous uh, Congress party rules was a strong supporter of Cuba. It's a historical connection is in the non-aligned movement. Uh, and they used to send help in such times. Do you know if in the present uh, right of center regime of Modi, uh, has India din done anything to support Cuba as a government to government support? That's my question to you. And any other government who has defied the United States and send help. I understand from Gloria that China has done it indirectly because uh, of the um, sanctions, etc. So I want to know if any of the speakers can enlighten me on the governments of the world's support to Cuba. Oh, I can say that I don't know about India. Sorry, um, I'll definitely look that up afterwards. Maybe someone else knows. But I think what's very important is what happened in the days after the July 11 disturbances. And that was in particular that of Mexico. And um, not only having sent two ships and then later a Navy ship with goods, food and medicine, which was extremely helpful in recognition of the, of the crisis that Cuba was facing, but also President Lopez Obrador spoke very sharply to say that the OAS, the Organization of American States, should be um, 
Oh, could you admit my sister? She's trying to get into the Billy Lariva. Um, that the OAS should be dismantled, which is a very strong statement to make. And another funny and important development, ironic development, is that in the last few years, as you know, Luis Almagro, the puppet head of the OAS, has done everything he could to undermine Bolivia, Venezuela, Cuba, and to no avail. And therefore, they formed the Lima Group, which was ostensibly the right-wing governments that would do the bidding of the US, form together, try to carry out measures. And they're actually not an internationally recognized body. Nonetheless, Lima is, as we know, in Peru. And as soon as uh, Castillo, the new president, you know, left-leaning president was elected in Peru, he withdrew from that Lima group. And when Lopez Obrador was elected, no longer was this 35 years of tended to be right-wing governments in Mexico in power anymore, but that Robles Obrador also said we're not part of the Lima group anymore. And so that's a shock to the U.S., one of the instruments they tried to use. But Lopez Obrador also said that Cuban people, by the resistance of 60 years to the blockade and defending the revolution, should be regarded officially as a world heritage site, you know, the non-tangibles by the United Nations because of the resistance. And that's, that's a great statement. I think the US certainly has, uh, since Obama, been able to undo some of what was progressively developing in Latin America, like the overthrow of the Honduras President Celaya, but they haven't been entirely successful and they can't push their agenda completely. And Cuba, is being seen more and more as a symbol of resistance and great anger growing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Trayan. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, I have a question and then a comment. Was Cuba cut off from the Swiss financial system you know, the system that does the financial transaction, transactions throughout the world. Because otherwise, when you're cut off, you have to barter. Uh, the other comment I have to make, it appears the U.S. is never going to end the bar, uh, embargo. The only other way I think it's going to be able to help Cuba if Russia, China, and other countries say to hell with the sanctions, stop worrying about they're going to sanction our ships, just go ahead and uh, give them what, the, help them out as much as you can because these countries are being sanctioned, Russia, China, by the US. The hell with the US sanctions and uh, help Cuba out. This is the only way because otherwise it's just gonna be a long lasting uh, embargo and the poor Cuban people are gonna suffer being choked to death. That's my comment. Um. Our speakers should just jump in if you want to uh, respond, or we can have a few comments and then have you respond, whatever you want to do. Okay, um, I'm going to call on Mary next. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see all of you. I really appreciate it and thank the remarks by Gloria and Cheryl and very much could relate to what Pablo was saying, since as quite a few of you know here, I just returned from Cuba in June, having spent 11 of the previous 18 months there and actually started working on the Saving Lives campaign in April of 2020 from Cuba. Um, and am very much committed to it. I, I also really wanna thank Bob Schwartz who has been doing this work of providing medical supplies to Cuba for 30 years, and not just Cuba, but Central America, and who had the brilliance to bring the syringe campaign to Saving Lives and to the National Network, which got all of us involved. And I'd like to follow up. I put some other things in the um, 
chat, but I'd like to follow up on what Cheryl was saying about bringing new people in and also building on this incredible work we've done, uh, which is that I believe, and Bob can speak to this, that uh, global health partners will now be turning to providing medical supplies. And Gloria talked a lot about what that need is. And um, I actually would like to issue a challenge, which is if we do have people who support and are in solidarity with Cuba and 50 states, I would like to see as many of the states as possible adopt and sponsor a container of medical supplies, which would mean raising about $16,000. And I'm going to try to do that in Massachusetts. $16,000, I don't think is a lot of money when we've just shown that we can raise 500,000. Uh, and then, you know, whatever medical supplies Global Health Partners has, we can, we can fill those. But also, there's other work that we can do to follow up on all this tremendous work that I think people have done over the last year that has brought in new people. For instance, with all of these city councils and town councils, which are primarily new people, we could follow up and we could even draft for them letters to the editors and op-ed pieces. And, and bring them to them and ask them to bring them to their constituencies so that we're, we're building ever wider circles. And in that regard, something that just strikes me that I would like to put out there, which is that the following June 23rd and the subsequent events, which Gloria and Pablo in particular outlined, the world is forming an, an international cordon around Cuba, humanitarian cordon around Cuba. Who is left out of that as we were left out of the UN vote is the United States. And it sounds sort of silly to say it this way, but is the United States really going to be left out of this humanitarian cordon that has, has rallied, that is rallying the world and are we really going to have egg on our face and be following this insane policy? And that's long enough for me. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay, um, I have two more people on the stack. Um, Walter, you're next. Um, hi, can everybody hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can. Hi, uh, I'm Walter Lippman in Los Angeles, and I run a news service called Cuba News. I've been doing it for over 20 years. And the uh, main thing that we do is put out English translations from the Cuban media between 20 and 40 every single day. So those of you who want to follow Cuba, I'd like to invite you all to join. I put the, the, the address to which you can subscribe uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, um, on the chat function and take the daily summary because that way you'll only get one item a day with a listing of all of the previous day's translations. So there is no other service in the whole world like what I'm doing but it's English translations from the Cuban media. Mary uh, participates and other people participate, but I'd like to invite you all to uh, take that subscription. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. Um, hey, people Joe. Should, people should put down their hand after they've spoken. It makes it a lot easier to keep the stack current. Richard W., you had your hand up. Do you, would you like to speak? Sure, why not? <laughs> First, the Marxist uh, New England weather report is uh, we're starting to get uh, rain bands up here. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to uh, uh, get in a little bit. It seems to me that um, in some sense we're operating on an old model. And that old model sort of um, uh, emphasizes economic stuff uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, we're, we're collecting money for syringes or we're collecting, you know, uh, or, adv or advocating uh, a dropping of boy economic boycotts. It seems to me that we're getting beat on, um, on other avenues that, that we really maybe want to explore. 
uh, and I, I want to add two of them in particular. Uh, and that is, uh, one of them is when I talk to people, you know, they're all aware of, of the, the past history of what the United States has done. But then they say, but what about those, you know, but they're, 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 those Cuban people, they, they don't have a democracy down there. And so, you know, and so that, so we're getting beat on that. And it seems we're getting beat on uh, uh, that uh, human rights as well. And the third, I'm, I, maybe I should say three things. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody here has been, uh, I've been reading uh, Gene Sharp, who was the, uh, the father of, um, of the color revolutions. And one of the things that he points out is uh, the need to take control of culture. And I think we've sort of dropped that. We allow the Biden administration, for example, they've got their, their Harvard uh, art person, uh, you know, uh, I'm speaking against Cuba, but we, but we have a lot of art out here that's not getting out into the public area. Uh, and I think we need to start really uh, looking at that kind of stuff. I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you, it's Richard. Still, and it's still raining. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Gloria, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, you know, we, we are fish swimming in the giant ocean of U.S. propaganda. And, and it's a particularly disconcerting when you read the news. I read the New York Times, Washington Post, and the New York Times has been absolutely the worst about Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And I mean, they have good social coverage in the US, but they're so part of this media war. And so we can get very demoralized and think, wow, it's so tragic. I really recommend that people um, follow the left media like Mission Verdad. I mean, I can type some of these. We have a whole listing of progressive media related to Latin America, uh, the gray zone, you know, Intercept has some articles. The left, the the left, you know, socialist papers, and um, I just put a video in, which I think is really excellent. I did an interview with Raúl Capote, who was a double agent, uh, pretending to be a CIA, and he exposed a U.S. plan in 2006 that was very related to what they did with Juan Guaido, and so on. But I think we need to spread our left information and progressive information and those that question and counter U.S. propaganda to our circles. It, it seems like an overwhelming task or like the idea of countering the cultural lies. You know, that's what, that's what the CIA started after World War II and they've continued ever since. And it's an uphill battle, but, you know, I have so many friends who will read something and then they get disconcerted. And then when you give them something, it's like, oh, it's like a light went on in their heads. And so we have to suggest that. I'm, I'm looking right now, because I can't find the search button <laughs> of the Answer Coalition. I've, it's a uh, list of progressive media for Venezuela and Cuba. And um, I, mean, I, I wrote a piece that I'm submitting to the New York Times. It won't get published because not only is the official media of the New York Times hostile to Cuba, but the, the, the opinion pieces, the op-eds are also hostile to Cuba. They don't provide a different point of view. And that's something we should you know, protest if we can. But I think that things like the caravans, which we haven't had public actions for Cuba, not just with the pandemic, but before that recently, getting back into the street driving the cars, reaching audiences in all the cities that Cheryl mentioned, including here in San Francisco, has been very powerful. And it, mo it keeps us mobilized as well. Thank you. Um, next is Yusuf, followed by Jean. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh for uh, last uh, couple of speakers for, uh, and questions and, uh, and bring up this point. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, after uh, 
the uh, 1990s, um, uh, starting with Yugoslavia, um, the uh, the left has uh, sort of uh, uh, lost the uh, its original initiative on um, the discourse in many areas. And um, do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, many uh, uh, have taken, uh, many former uh, uh, allies and a section of the left have taken up the narrative of uh, the, uh, the imperialist uh, uh, agenda. And sometimes they say, well, okay, uh, all these are, uh, well, let's not have military intervention, but, uh, you know, uh, 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 Venezuela is uh, undemocratic, Nicaragua is uh, uh, undemocratic, Cuba is um, uh, undemocratic, and so on and so forth. So they um, uh, uh, load the uh, ammunition uh, uh, on the gun, but uh, don't fire it, but just uh, other people uh, 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 fire it. So. Uh, uh, maybe some call, um, I'd like some more comments on this um, uh, uh, problem we have. Okay, um, let's let's have, accumulate a few more, and then people can respond. Jean is next. Okay, thank you, and uh, really. Uh, appreciate all the comments, both of our speakers and people who have participated. And I have to say, I'm really impressed by uh, the amount of people who have been traveling and getting all this information and bringing us back. I, I don't get out of Oakland very much, as I said. But uh, back in 1998, I did go to Cuba as part of the uh, 150th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And I gave a paper, which uh, uh, isn't all that important, but I, I remember one of the sessions, one of us North Americans, not me, uh, asked the question, how can you say you'd have a democracy when you only have one political party? And the response was, under Batista, we had seven political parties and no democracy. Now we have one political party and we have democracy. And this is a very profound statement that we really have to think about this. And I really get riled up when people talk about, oh, we democratic countries like the United States. And, and I just say, you know, I've lived in the United States all my life. And I know what we have here is not democracy. So I just want to think we really need to take the lessons of Cuba, China, and, and Viet Vietnam, North Korea, and look at uh, how they function, and they have democracy, uh, and we don't. So I think we need to look at our conceptual framework, how we look at the world, and really thank uh, Cuba for educating us so much. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, John McAuliffe is next. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, one particular response I was just said is that when Mariela Castro was here about five years ago. Um, she was interviewed on CNN and said that she thought the single party was a function of the embargo uh, and the need to defend against it and that that would be an open question after the embargo was lifted. So it's still on the CNN record if you wanna watch it. Um, a question for, for Mary um, and uh, others who may have been in Cuba more recently. It seems to me that the Cuban government handled the immediate problem of the demonstrations, which a friend of our mutual friend of ours estimates involved 100,000 people, not a few hundred people, but uh, they handled that in two ways. They handled it with the control of the state. Um, they used fairly strong police and quasi-police mechanisms to control it. 
Um, and that's what a government does. Uh, our government does it, the Cuban government did it to get control of what was going on. But they also took two steps to try to respond to public demands, uh, not the patria vida demands, but what was generating uh, the mass participation, which, you know, mass, but still it's a country of 11 million. So, you know, it's like saying that Black Lives Matter was the mass activity of the Black community. It wasn't, it was part of the Black community. Um, at any rate, the positive things they did was to accelerate the economic reforms in terms of small and medium enterprises. Um, and they also allowed people to bring in hand luggage, medicine and, and uh, food and whatever else without having to pay import duties. Um, the other thing that's happened, and you can find it on our blog, is a tremendous amount of ferment in the left in Cuba of posts that have been made. Uh, Arbolaya is in, if you look at uh, uh, the, um, what's the blog that comes out of Miami? Um, the uh, Progreso Weekly. You go to Progreso Weekly, you'll see a couple of very powerful essays by Arbolaya, but he's not the only one talking about the need to get fundamental changes made. Um, the question that I have, since I haven't been back, is how much is that debate happening within and on the fringes of the party about the need to really think about internal changes that have to happen? Uh, obviously, the best of all possible worlds is ending the embargo or the medium best is getting back to the Obama policies. But in terms of what the Cubans themselves can do, how much do you think is at play at this point? How much debate is going on in the, amongst the Cubans themselves in their internet? Oh, the other thing I wanted to say, because people may not have noticed it, is the other thing, unfortunately, the Cubans are doing is they're making it illegal to post certain things on the internet. Um, there's a new piece of legislation to do that, which is what the Vietnamese do and the Chinese do to control the internet. And it's what some people in the US would like to do. But you know, that's another real factor about what's going on. Gloria, go ahead. I don't know if you want to answer, Mary. Sorry. I'd like to make a comment. I can say something afterwards if, if you like. OK, well. One thing, John, I appreciate your being on and, and your, your uh, offering your views. Nobody I know and talk to, and I've talked to many people of different political views, nobody says that it was 100,000 people in, in uh, Cuba demonstrating. Uh, I don't even think it was 10,000. Um, you know, we can't quantify exactly because we weren't there, but people who were there, nobody says 100,000. And I only say that because you referred to my saying, you know, a smaller number. I do not exaggerate demonstrations here. I always count them and I was looking very hard. But anyway, 11, as you said, 11 million people are suffering this. And so it was a small number regardless. But I think that we have to understand Cuba, Cuba's system of the police in general, historically, has been one of truly respecting people's rights. The constitution, the laws, the application. I've been there so many times. I've seen many exchanges with the police and people and people do not fear the police. I mean, they certainly worry about being caught by the police in a traffic incident because they're very strict about that. But I've never seen actions of police brutality and, um, and yet this depiction of them as a repression from the US government. If you look at the videos, the police didn't have RoboCop uniforms. They didn't have all the shields and the huge weapons that they carry here. They were being chased and they were being attacked. And I think that unfortunately it creates a situation where the police, they're gonna have to figure out 
how to protect police from future attacks and how to make sure that these vulnerabilities that the U.S. is attempting, because the U.S. is always looking. In fact, they're trying to appeal to the military, which is a joke, to see if they can do what they try to do at the border between Colombia and Venezuela when they try to bring that humanitarian aid in. And I was there at the border at that point in 2019. But I think in respect to this law that was passed, and there was a previous law also, about a, uh, a year and a half ago, on New Year's Eve and New Year's morning, in the middle of the night, two men, and there's a, there a lot of these criminal activities, terrorist activity included, that had been fomented by Miami groups. And they literally go and pay people after they carry out. A young teenager threw a, fi a Molotov cocktail at a gas station after he was told, you'll be paid 500 CUC, about $500. Because they search for these youth and they search for black youth. You know, people have money shortages. And they say, if you, if you uh, catch fire on a cane field, we'll pay you 200. If you throw a rock at a bank or an MLC store, we'll pay you 200. All these acts, and certainly you can regard firing a Molotov at a gas station and terrorism. Well, the teenagers, minors, do not go to jail in Cuba. That's pretty remarkable. And, and um, they said that on TV, as everyone knows, minors do not go to jail for their crimes, um, which really belies is the accusation of the repression. But this January 1st, two men seen on video and later arrested through animal blood on 17 or 18 busts or statues of Jose Martí. That is a desecration of their greatest symbol, not of just the revolution, but of their nation, Jose Martí. And to do that was an enormous affront to the Cuban people. And that's illegal. And that's a law that was passed where the U.S. is saying, oh my God, they're arresting people for these expressions. It's trying to break down solidarity and, and unity and peace in the island and to create a chaos. The other is this law that you just mentioned that restricts what people can do on the internet. The very fact that that woman could be part of a CIA plot on video the day of July 11th that could have created a worse disturbance, a worse situation, where she claimed that her husband was shot to death by the police. Yeah, that's illegal now. There wasn't a law against that before. Now that woman would be subject to sanction, as she should be, because it's, it's, the, it's an intent to create a more dangerous situation and medialize the fake news that the U.S. wants to implement ever more to try to create a chaos where they can tear and carry out military action. And we shouldn't think that couldn't happen. Remember, Guantanamo base, 47 square miles. And I'm just being emotional. I'm not addressing John. 47 square miles of Cuban territory. And if we remember the early years of the revolution when soldiers were likely to shoot into Cuban free territory and that we should not underestimate Remember, 35,000 Cubans were being imprisoned on that territory during the immigration crisis of 1994, 1995. And the U.S. has all kinds of plans that we don't even know about. So I just want to say that I think they have a right to defend themselves. I think they have, they have tr historically, traditionally, a culture of respecting human rights, of respecting people's rights. Um, and uh, the greatest human rights violation, of course, is a blockade and the U.S. aggression. But they, they have to be able to make sure to protect themselves against uh, terrorism. Remember, uh, May, in May 2019, two men were paid, as they admitted, to derail a, four train cars near the Mariel uh, huge economic infrastructure a foreign investment. To derail a train in Cuba is a serious, serious attack. That's all. Thank you. Um, Mary, did you have a response before we? 
Sure, there, there's a couple of things I can say. And first of all, I should premise it by saying that I am a perm permanent resident of Cuba. It's the equivalent of having a green card. So when I say, well, let's see. I mean, there's like three different things I need to say, John, about this. Number one, I think the response to the outbreak of, aside from the vandals, just sort of panic and exhaustion on the part of people, uh, that the response of the government was different than what you're saying. I think that the, uh, the process of uh, finally passing the law on small and medium businesses, and what was the other one you said? Allowing people to bring stuff without it being oh, and that, the import duties. I don't think that was a response to the outbreaks. I think it was a response to the natural course that this horrendous panic, pandemic is taking on people. The response to the outbreaks and outbursts time and time again in comments on, I don't read Facebook very much, but in other media, people are harking back to what happened in 1994, when similarly, people just had had it. And there was this incredible outburst down in central Havana. And I have friends who were there and witnessed it and all. And I think people had said, has said, you know, we have to learn, we have learned from that what's appropriate now. And what's appropriate now is to address not the vandals, leaving them aside, leaving aside all of the stuff that Gloria said about the ways in which this was. We have to address. And I put some of this in the perspectives that I, that I sent out a couple of weeks. We have to address the ways in which people are feeling that they're not heard and that they can't take it and that they're not having solutions. And I'm very relieved to hear that because so many young people that I know in Cuba feel alienated and they feel that the government doesn't listen to them and that there's no way forward. And that people are discussing as well. They started discussing it. Uh, Esteban Rallis had a very interesting um, uh, commentary on the San Isidro. And Victor Fowler has a brilliant piece on the San Isidro people. And, and I think that the thing about, the, about Cuban society, and if you live there, you can see this in practice, but even if you just visit there, when has any of you who have visited Cuba, allowing a year in between, found the same society that was there a year previously? It's not. I always like to say, Cuba might be slogging through mud, but this light slogging forward, whereas we're slipping backwards through the mud on our asses. But in terms of the police, I think this is very, I have members of my family who actually grew up in marginalized Afro-descendant communities whose highest aspiration is to be accepted into the police force. And I have known many police people and I have known police people that I couldn't give the time of day for. And I actually was arrested last year. So I have direct experience. I was arrested because I lost it with the lines that were being made and the lack of social distancing in my neighborhood. And I even started taking pictures. And so the police arrested me and they took me to the local police station, you know, that blue one up, up near, um, what is that hospital? Uh, and they sat me down and I was sobbing away and sobbing away and nobody was paying attention to me. And it turned out that they had sent away for the uh, political police. And the political police, and I knew they were political police because they were very young and they were in plain clothes. They took me into a back room and they said, now explain yourself what's going on. So I explained it to them and they said, you're right, you can't do what you're doing. And we will talk to those people, those policemen who were not maintaining order. But you have to understand that people cannot be expected to socially distance for five hours at a time in these horrendous situations. Something else, if you follow the news in Cuba, following the events that happened. Oh, and I never, I never, anyway. I, rem I got to know the police on those lines because they were my stores in my neighborhood and everything blew over. 
But one of the interesting things that came out of the events and the activities were all the interviews on television in Cuba. And you can turn into Canal Caribe on YouTube and watch it every day. You can follow the news. Were all the interviews with police people and even with police people's mothers talking about how hard it was for them in that situation. And I don't think that was a lot of guff and propaganda, John. I think everybody was shaken up. Just as in 1994, people were shaken to their core because everybody in Cuba complains. Everybody has a hard time and everybody just muddles along. And when things like this happen, the true leaders in the country say, muddling isn't enough. We have to try to fix it. And if you read a lot of the commentaries from all ages of people, such as I published in Perspectives, and I will send that to anybody who wants it, mary.ansarah at gmail.com, people are reflecting what's happening. And the leadership is saying, it is urgent that we implement the economic plan that we passed and we can't wait and we have to do it. And at the same time, we have to do work at the base. We have to do work at the base. And they're talking, they're going back and referencing back to what happened after 1994 when they created the, the social worker brigades that got a lot of, I think it was something like 80,000 young people off of the streets who were studying or working and into you know, appropriate, I'm going on too long, Sharon. I am. Yeah. Okay. You get my point. All right. Let me, let me just answer, Gloria, that it was Mark Frank in a Zoom yesterday who gave the 100,000 estimate. And Mark has lived in Cuba, I don't know if as long as Mary, but almost as long. And I, I trust him inherently that he's saying honestly what he thinks is the truth. Um, but Mary, on the question of ferment oh, in the kind of left intellectuals, professors, folks uh, like Atemas and Arbalaya, do you see something happening that's a new phenomena in the level of public discourse? Um, I don't think I should answer because I think there's other people, but I'll be glad to answer you privately or at a different time. I'm not ignoring the might, question, but everybody to, else wants to talk. We can come back to that in a minute, but uh, let me, Walter requested to say something very briefly, and then Tony is next on the stack. So, Walter, if you can be brief, I'll let you. Yes, I your... will. <clears throat> yes, I certainly will be brief. Uh, <clears throat> I just posted in the, in the chat section two articles, one from a Cuban attorney and one from Covert Action magazine about the media. And I, I'd like to encourage you all to take a look at that article. The um, one thing that they talk about is how in the American media, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, they posted pictures and, and captions saying there were gigantic demonstrations against the government. And the pictures that they showed were demonstrations in favor of the government. And if you click on the one from Covert Action, you'll see there's a giant demonstration. And right in there, anyone can recognize the image of Gerardo Hernandez of the Cuban Five. He's in there. And the caption in the New York Times and in the Wall Street and in the Washington Post was that this was a big anti-government, <clears throat> excuse me, anti <clears throat> excuse me, anti-government demonstration. And the second thing about this new law called Decree Law 35 is that the Cuban government did not have until now a legal framework to regulate the international as many other countries do. And the article by the Cuban attorney explains that and gives a listing of the, all the other countries and the kind of many other countries and the kind of uh, legislation that, that they have to regulate. So if people are cooperating with that, uh, are cooperating with circulating this kind of disinformation, that is something that they can go after you if, go after you for. Now, so far, they haven't gone after anybody that we know of because of that. We would hear about it right away if they did. Anyway, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, next is Tony and then Cheryl. Go ahead, Tony. OK, um, this is a good, this is a very good discussion. And I, I'm appreciating the, um, 
the fact that there's different perspectives coming forward on, which is part of why I wanted to do this thing in the first place is to, is to talk about the issues. And I want to go and say that, um, I think it's obvious, but um, people may not know this, but um, Pastors for Peace is going to be organizing a, a delegation pretty soon. There's also word that I've gotten that the Vince Ramos Brigade is going to be doing similar things. A lot of this is based on the situation with COVID, uh, both here and there. Um, and so a lot of it is um, sort of being prepared and looked at. And I, one of the things that, um, that I heard early on when I got involved with, with Cuba many years ago um, was, uh, don't, don't take my word for it, go and see for yourself. And I think that we need as a, as a people in this country to really find ways to get there and to bring our material support and our solidarity to Cuba and try to understand what's going on on the ground there. Um, and that um, there's no question in my mind that there's a lot of discontent and, there's, and Mary said it correctly, Cubans complain and they complain a lot. Um, and I've known, I've known that, um, but does that translate into um, some kind of an insurrection? No, it doesn't. Um, and that um, I say that very clearly, and I think that's part of the war that's going on, and that not only is Cuba being victimized, but the people of the United States are being victimized by this kind of disinformation. And we need very much to, to see for ourselves and to urge people, especially young people, but people in general, um, to, to go and, and support those who do it, just as we did with the Vince Ramos Brigade 1969, which I was lucky to be on. It changed my life. Um, and I think that go, go there and see for yourself and learn and, and like look at the situation. And yeah, it's a, it's a tough situation people are in. And you know, but but um, what's the cause of that situation? Is it terrible totalitarian government in Cuba, or is it the fucking blockade? Okay, and I think I, I think I, you know what the answer is. Um, I want to just thank everybody for this participation today. It's going to continue and um, get involved. Get involved with um, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua solidarity. Get involved with the, with the National Network on Cuba. Um, I really appreciate uh, the whole event today and um, I'm glad we're doing it and we're gonna continue it. And it's also been recognized in Cuba of the work that people are doing here. And we, we are very important for these folks in Cuba, um, our friends, and we are their friends and they're our friends. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. Cheryl, you're next. Well, I want to address the, the question of democracy in relation to the United States, <laughs> um, because it's, you know, this is a country where corporations have, are considered equal with people. Um, is that really what democracy looks like? Uh, so setting up an, some kind of ideal of democracy and trying to measure Cuba against it does not look at the relationships that are happening now. Cuba has a right to defend itself. It does have a right to defend itself. It is a, about the same size as Michigan, the same size as Los Angeles County. And it has the full force. Uh, and there was a question too about SWIFT. A number of years ago, I can't remember the exact year, maybe Gloria does, the US, some US software was put into the SWIFT econom uh, economic exchange system that moderates international trade. And as a result of that, Cuba was not permitted to use SWIFT. Um, that was the time when their bank accounts were closed in the United States. And uh, I believe now there's still only one bank that can handle the Cuban embassy's uh, financial transactions. It's um, the, the, 
the question too about what has happened in 1994. I don't know how many people have seen this book called Cuba, what I learned about Cuba by going to Cuba by uh, Antonio Zamora, who unfortunately has died. When I saw him, met, met him, saw him speak about this book, I was actually in the Cuban interest section. And I had to look around because I thought I was in a parallel universe. Here was somebody who had fought against Cuba in the Bay of Pigs and it helped to begin the Cuban American National Foundation. In 1995, people in Miami were saying the end of the revolution has come because of the special period. And they said, you know, they were telling lies about what was happening. And his wife said, go to Cuba, go to Cuba and see. He went to Cuba and found out it was a lie. Just like now, it is a lie. And our focus as people who live in the United States needs to be on our own government. Cuba, in my opinion, can take care of itself. The Cuban Communist Party and the people of Cuba have their own country and they can, they can take care of the problems that they have and issues that they have and will, have shown that they will if the United States will get off their back. And I think we can end the blockade. And really the link to that is finding the intersections so that people in the United States understand that Cuba pre presents a, a different kind of life, a life that as difficult it is for the Cubans today, the kind of stress that people have about being worried about whether they have a job, whether that means they won't be able to have a place to live, whether they're going to be impoverished because of health care or they have student debt that they'll never pay. And at the same time, voting rights are being restricted. I mean, remember in Cuba, when you're 16, you are registered to vote. And voting is regarded as something that is, uh, you know, not required, but something that is expected as part of your citizenship. And here, every effort is made, especially black vote. I live in Detroit, especially the black vote. You know, where that when they, I took it personally when they said that the vote in Detroit had dead people voting. Every person who died of COVID in Detroit should have had the right to vote in that election and should have been able to vote against Trump and really now what Biden is doing too. But showing the, the, the concrete gains that people can make um, and that Cuba has made that it can mean for our lives here is, is important. This is no democracy. Look at the joke that is being done with COVID now. Uh, back and forth, back and forth. Is that what democracy looks like? That nobody can make a decision and stick to it? Um, really, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's one of those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl, I'd like to add something to that. I really appreciate what Cheryl said, if I can. And that is that um, political democracy is part of the superstructure of any economic system. And there's basically two economic systems in the world. Capitalism, uh, in which we know what capitalism is because we live it here, where you don't have the right to housing or healthcare or education, but that the political system of Congress and so on, everybody knows it's the lobbyists make the laws. Everyone knows it's the system that rules. In the, political, in the political system. And in Cuba, where the people are in power, the workers are in power, where the province do not rule and, do, and are not the domain, it's the right to life in Cuba that comes first. And that's why the most expensive things in the US of healthcare, housing, education, and more are free in Cuba, but it comes at a great, great cost. And so all of that is challenged. I want to say something about what Mary said. I really appreciate what you said about the issue of the police and so on in society. 
in, in some of these commentaries, if you read about the exchanges that the leaders are having, the well-known people like Gerardo Hernandez or political leaders, women's groups and so on, they're going out into the streets to talk to people. There's a comment that has said, we're hearing them. We're addressing what we can. You know, people complain about the corruption that they see in stores. When there are shortages, there's corruption. And not just leading people, but in the stores where someone can find a way to pay a few extra pesos to get something in front of everybody else. That's what happens when you have shortages. It's a natural outcome. But that, um, that they said, not only are we hearing people and addressing what we can, but they're like, but people have to understand, we're not gonna be able to meet every need because of the economic crisis that when there's blackouts, it's because they have to address the greater need of the people who are need the ventilators and electricity. It's a tough, tough situation. It's between a rock and a hard place, a very hard place. And we have to understand that um, in our country and focus on the issue. I mean, people say, well, get back to Biden's, I mean, to Obama's measures. Yeah, sure. But let's demand the ending of the blockade on that. Okay, I want to call on Julie, who has her hand up. I think that's me. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I came in and out. Thanks. Thanks for this important forum. I've really enjoyed it. So I'm listening, and I, I see how in the each person in their small way can reach out to individuals and stuff. I'm an educator, and I've often thought and wondered how we can provide, reach out maybe to individual teachers, but also to teachers unions. I know my union, UTLA, we have a statement about the right of Palestinians, and there's been some pushback, so we're working on that, but how we could provide um, curriculum for high school teachers so that we can have material that we can use in our classes and we have history classes, et cetera. So that those issues, I just had, you know, students and they were just having a sidebar and talk about, uh, I just heard these comments. It was, you know, totally off topic about the dictatorship in Cuba. It was very interesting. So I stopped and I go, oh, what are you guys talking about? And so a lot of conversation was generated. But I also think that reaching not only, you know, college age students, et cetera, but high school students who, like in the Black Lives Matter movement, were so instrumental. I mean, many of my students took to the streets and they learned so much. But how that we could provide curriculum, workshops, et cetera, and like that 50 state challenge throughout the 50 states so that when teachers are addressing like, for lack of a better term, critical race theory, that is also part of the discussion. Anyway, thank you. I think education of the youth is really important as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, someone wants to know how to raise their hand. Um, if you go to full screen, you'll see um, at the bottom something labeled reactions and if you click on reactions one um, one choice is to raise your hand um, let me see now um, I don't see any hands at the moment um, we usually stop oh there's there you are okay McMullen you're you're next Go ahead. What happened? Are you there? I'm sorry. I'm I'm not seeing that person now. He's, he's in the meeting, but, and he's unmuted if he wants to go ahead and ask his question, McMullen or she. Yeah. Uh, maybe just away. Okay, we'll come back to you if you, if you want to jump in. Uh, Norma, you're next.
<clears throat> Hi, everybody. It's good to see everybody here and to know about all the efforts that are made, which are dear to my uh, heart and soul and all. Um, I need to chest uh, to point us toward what we need to do. Uh, Mehmet, one of our comrades, uh, explained to me some months back when we were still going to the library, actually. It, it just turned around from work he was doing, setting up chairs or something. He said, well, you know, the Venezuela got what it, hit, what it got to through power from the grassroots and from the top, uh, meaning that people were elected that would support what was going on. Uh, I've just read a book called Ruska, R-U-S-S-K-A, a, a, a fiction of Russia from the past 1800 years. And what's described constantly is that people are always working to organize, uh, to unify over their concerns and cares. And uh, of course, those are all, all taken from them the same way they have been here in the uh, United States. Uh, the the power, the ability for people to get together is seen is created into a monster that has to be attacked constantly, and it was there too. Uh, the description of the revolution in Russia in this book is a very mild kind of progression. Things just happened where people became able to take over everything that was going on. Um, we are accustomed to the police will shoot us if we try any of that. I'm thinking about boats going to Cuba. They'll they'll bomb those boats, you know, it, with impunity. It, it just leaves you gasping to think what the resistance is against lib, um, a mass liberation, mass liberatory struggles. I, I suggest over and over to people in these kinds of circumstances, in this kind of circumstance, talk to everybody and say the words. Say something about socialism, that you're there for it. Uh, figure out ways to say it, like something about health care. You could get health care. You know? uh, and, and find ways to say what we want instead of covering it up. We've been accustomed since the McCarthy era to not saying it. My folks did that. They didn't say what they were doing. I didn't know. I mean, I've been a communist all my life, but I didn't know <laughs> the details because they wouldn't and felt that they couldn't talk about it, uh, that they were subject to being punished for uh, being out there. I just posted something talking about being out there. Uh, Cheryl was saying the worries that people have, you have to mention the worry that your child will be killed if they go outside. Okay. Um, thank you, Norma. So it's approaching one o'clock. And so what I would like to do is, um, have the ask the speakers to for some last words if you would like uh, Gloria and Cheryl and Tony if you'd like any or all of you to say the last words before we end the program. You want to go, Cheryl, first? Uh, okay, <laughs> I will. Um, we, I think we can't underestimate how important these discussions are. Mm -hmm. um, really, to come together and share our views and what's happening, uh, I really appreciate being asked to be here. And I do want to add, because I was a little bit amiss at the beginning in not giving recognition to the indigenous land that I, was stolen that I stand on here, the Anishinaabe people um, here in, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, it's become a feature of the Venceremos Brigade meetings along with uh, pronouns, which mine are she and her. 
Uh, I know that those of us in the older generation don't generally do that, but a lot of uh, the younger folks do and, and, and view it as important. So uh, thank you so much for uh, this, this opportunity to talk and to discuss Cuba. I've put some links in the, uh, in the chat if you want a list of the resolutions. There's a resolutions committee that meets bi-weekly uh, people are welcome if they want to work on resolutions. Uh, and the Saving Lives also meets biweekly uh, coming up this Wednesday on Wednesdays. So um, thank you so much. And thank you for all that you individually do, because I'm sure you do, uh, or you wouldn't be here. Gloria. Well, I want to thank the Nebel Proctor Library and all the folks who are um, associated with doing these events, not just about Cuba, but the international situation. And um, I think that one would hope that the American people would say that with what happened in Afghanistan to really question from the start of any new U.S. adventure or what's going on right now with Cuba. Unfortunately, I think that the U.S. ruling class is very adept at creating uh, narratives, lies, and campaigns based on the things they think people will respond to, as I said before about police repression in Cuba and blaming Cuba for the very thing the U.S. has caused. Right now it's calm, it's peaceful. Cuba's, you know, on this um, offensive of doing the things that they've been trying to do and I appreciate everyone's comments. So I think we have to be alert. Um, we're going to have a, the ANSA Coalition and the Vencedemos Brigade in the Bay Area are going to have a special forum on September 19. You know, there's a lot of forums going on about Cuba. I don't think we can have too many. We're going to have a special one. We're going to invite Cubans to come in and, and speak at it. It'll be September 19. I will be in Cuba from the 2nd to the 16th of September. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me about that. Um, I'm being, I'm taking four suitcases because of the not being taxed for extra weight. I'll be taking as much medicine and those, um, the resin for those 3D printers as I can. And let's all keep together, let's keep alert. You can sign on to the answercoalition.org website to be alerted about any of the mobilizations that will be taking place. We're all part of this movement to defend Cuba's right to live. Let Cuba live, that great New York Times ad. By the way, the New York Times ad that was published on July 23rd, I think it was, of the movement. Uh, it was answered by the New York Times, by the way, by an op-ed that tried to counter it, which I think shows it had an effect. So let's keep moving on, sisters and brothers. Viva Cuba. Thank you. And Tony, as the organizer of this forum, do you have any, you get the last word if you'd like it. Yeah, um, I wanna thank everybody that's been involved in this process. Um, the, the speakers, Gloria, Pablo, and Cheryl, also the folks at the Institute, um, and you know, um, everybody that's participated in this discussion, um, and I, I want to echo what was just said by uh, I, th I, I think uh, Cheryl and, and Gloria, but you know we need to to really involve ourselves and that again there's a lot of people out there that are really wondering what the hell is going on in Cuba. And I think you know despite all the negative stuff and all of the all of the stuff that's happened, it's an opportunity we should look at it as an opportunity to to to, to talk about these situations and to talk about the color revolution or the work of the network um, or, or an answer or whatever. I think that we all have responsibilities and opportunities to, to broaden this movement out. Um, and then it isn't just about feeling good. It's about doing concrete work, such as, uh, for example, the, the syringe campaign. I think that blew a lot of people's minds that we raised all that money. Um, in a relatively short period of time. And that's one example, there are others. Um, I just wanna thank everybody that's been involved and yes, we shall win, venceremos. Thank you very much.
Okay. <clears throat> on that note, thank you everybody for coming. If you're not on our mailing list, you can go to icssmarxist.org and you can sign up for the mailing list and get the future um, programs. Uh, Sharon, do you have permission to close the recording? Stop the recording now? Right. Sharon, this is Raj. Can yes. I turn, turn, yes. shut off? Oh, yes, room? please stop the recording, Raj. Okay, thank you. And it will be on in a couple of days on YouTube, correct? Yes, it will. In, be. Yeah, by Wednesday, we hope. It's also on our website, icssmarks.org. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com, and the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue. Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is Marxist 